On this episode of the Ask Mike Reinald Show, we talk about quadricep to hamstring ratio and ACL injuries. We talk about the difference between a PhD and a DPT. And then we talk, or actually we answer a great question is, if we had to take the PT boards right now, would we pass? The answer is definitely not yes. <laughs> the Ask Mike Reinald Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the Ask Mike Reinald Show. Uh, I'm up here at Champion PT and Performance up in Boston. Lenny McCrina, Dan Pope, Dave Tilly. Our, our new PT student extraordinaire for this semester, Jojo Coppolo from Stony Brook in New York. Right? Very good. Awesome. Listen, <laughs> we got some awesome New York. New York? The Boston people can't make fake New York accents. Where it's like, it's terrible. Let me have a sip of coffee. Coffee. Yeah, coffee. coffee. Yeah. All right, so, what, so we got some great, great questions. I am going to get my coffee. Jojo, hit away. Uh, Zach from Seattle, strength, and condition, uh, strength coach and physical therapy student at the University of Wisconsin, seeking practical knowledge in sports medicine. I love your podcast. Please offer your opinion on quad dominance and lack of relative hamstring strength when it comes to risk of ACL injury in athletes. What can strength coaches and physical therapists do to make your athletes more injury resistant in this regard? All right, this one's got Lenny written all over it, right? So Lenny, what do you got on, I'll, I'll rephrase that a little bit, what do you have on quad hamstring ratio for ACL injury rates? Yeah, I think, I think yeah. it's one of those, <laughs> yeah, I think it's one of those many theories that are out there that, you know, Tim Hugh and his group um, have put out, which I completely agree with, um, that especially in females who are jumping, landing, uh, they are quad dominant, meaning they don't end up in a nice uh, flex position that engages their hamstrings relative to their quads. So when you land super upright, knees relatively flex, but certainly not where we like it to be, they engage too much quads, which we know the quads will potentially um, not prevent posterior translation of the tibia like the hamstrings do. So you're going to get relative anterior translation. Um, if they don't have good hip uh, stability, so you're starting to get more frontal plane type movement uh, with an anterior type uh, position, then you start putting the ACL in a potential risk of injury. So that's, in a huge nutshell, we are always coaching our athletes to land more flex, more of a flex position, engaging more of the hamstrings. I don't know if you guys, that's a very simplistic I, yeah. overview of what I, we're doing. I think that was good. I mean, the, the only thing I'd add is, I mean, we do try to bias the, you know, the quad and the hamstring, you know, when, when we when we do our rehab progressions, right? So early on, we do a lot of quad work because the quad's inhibited so much after right. a, a knee injury. Uh, mm -hmm. But then once we get to more of the advanced phases, we're, we're trying to do more posterior chain and hamstring-based stuff right. to try to enhance that ratio. But, you know, it's one of those things. I mean, it, it's, it's a ratio for a reason, right? Yeah. Your quad's gigantic organic and important and strong I mean like I mean you're never going to get equal one-to-one -one ratio of your quad and your hamstring but again you know trying to you know emphasize that I think you know would be would, would be a good way to do it so yeah, without a biodex machine looking at ratios of say two-thirds as strong something like that you know you could use a handheld dynamometer but oftentimes you're not going to get accurate numbers um, not many have biodex so I mean to me I'm just loading hamstrings as much as I can more so in the advanced phase, I feel like posterior chain type stuff than quads. Mm -hmm. uh, early on it's quads, and I continue to hit the quads, but you're just nailing uh, hamstrings, glutes, uh, you know, especially deep into the rehab process. And coaching landing, getting them to land in more of a flex knee, coaching that soft, soft landing position, quiet landing if they're jumping and work on plyo. So really got to emphasize the flex knee position. For the same reason, for that hamstring involvement. Correct. That's, that's you'll, why. You'll get the hamstrings to kick in, yeah. One thing I want to add is that... Um, did you just raise your hand? I did. Yes, yes, Dan, Dan, just Dr. Pope. Dan. Dan just raised his hand. That's awesome. <laughs> well, I feel like when I was a strength conditioning professional, we thought so much about hamstrings um, that we forget about the quad. Like as, as far as we know, a lot of people are leaving a rehab facility without ad adequate quad strength. They need that right. eccentric quad control to land in that flex position, like Lenny's saying. Um, so I think that for a strength conditioning professional, we think, okay, we've got to get the hamstring super strong. You need to have a really strong quad, and a lot of times that's going to be weak even for years after the surgery. So I think it's super important that as a transitioning professional, you actually do train the quad and not just ignore the quad and think the hamstring is the most important thing. Yeah. So yeah. probably both. 
Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. I love it. I think we nailed it. Good. Jojo, hit it up. All right, next <laughs> is either Edwin or Edwin from South Africa. Which qualification do you believe to be more valuable, a PhD in physiotherapy or a DPT? All right, PhD in physiotherapy we've, we've or DBT. We chatted about this before. We, I mean, we, 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 we about chatted about the conversation. About, yeah. I don't know if we chatted about the, the PhD. No. We, 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 we get these questions yeah. a lot. So PhD versus DBT. DBT is clinical. PhD is academic. not. It's academic, research-based, that type of right. thing. It's not a lot of PhD. And, and trust me, I, I'm going to get a million tweets after I say this. It's not a ton of PhDs that are primary clinical, right? Like, if it's for a reason. If, if you want to if you want to teach, if you want to do clinical, uh, clinical, uh, or I'd say more like lab-based research type stuff, PhD is probably the route. If you want to, um, well, you have to get a DPT now, so that's kind of, yeah. so I guess it's just, what do you, what do you get a PhD or not? It's not like you can't get a DPT. When we get a doctor in DPT, that's almost like just saying your doctor is more clinical in how you treat and stuff like that. So um, I don't, if, look, you want to work in an outpatient clinic 40 hours a week and treat, 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 I don't think a PhD is going to help you, and I don't think someone's going to probably pay you more because you have it, yeah. you know, but but if you want to teach and if you want to do research, then I think the PhD is very valuable. Jojo. Agreed. <laughs> right. Retweet. Dave from NY. If you sat for the PT boards tomorrow, do you think you would pass? Ah, oh, great question. Let's start with Len this night. If you sat for the PT boards tomorrow, this is funny because our students, I wish Keisha was still here because yeah. Keisha <laughs> was studying like no one I've ever seen. I mean, she, in, in a good way. Uh, but uh, we have a lot of students that study, study, study during their clinical because we usually get that last semester uh, clinical rotation with students. Um, but yeah, we talk about it every time they're in there. It's hilarious. So Len, what do you think? I would say probably definitely no. Um, <laughs> There's, you know, all the encompassing, you know, cardiopulm and, and neuro and all the different tracks and probably basic orthopedics that they're teaching right now. Yeah. I would probably have to rethink everything and um, try to figure out what the question to, is trying to get out of me versus the test. what I would do uh, in, yeah. in clinic. I'll, and, I tell you, I will disagree yeah. with some of the sports medicine answers, I'm sure, and then yeah. that would be that would be, yeah, uh, that would be a problem. A I think it would be an interesting <laughs> study. I don't know if any PT would want to volunteer four hours at a time is to have a bunch of us take the test again. And, and see who would pass. Yeah, what, I don't know if we That's want to open point. that can of worms. <laughs> I, 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 so I would say, for me, going around the room, no, I don't think I would. But Lenny said it right. We've been working in outpatient orthopedic sports medicine for 20 years, right? So cardiopulmonary is like way gone in my mind. So I think that's why we wouldn't do it. I think we'd overthink some of the other things too, but um, yeah, I just, I don't, I, I don't think we're well-rounded anymore, right? People used to actually say that earlier on in my compare, uh, career. I remember it, like a critique people had of someone that just specialized in one thing, just saying how you weren't a good PT. And I'm like, what the heck does that mean? But like, like I'd rather be really good good at something than, than medium at everything, right? So I, I don't know, I thought that was weird. I think that's, I think that's the future, right? You don't, if you need ACL surgery for your knee, or worse, if you need open heart surgery, would you go to a generalist or would you go see someone yeah. that does open heart surgery all day? So Dave, would you pass? This is a fun I, question. If it happened, it would be by the skin of my teeth. Because <laughs> I think that, I think, I think I'm, I'm, it's only been a couple of How did you say yeah. you took the boards like 18 been, months ago? Yeah, <laughs> it hasn't been that long. <laughs> So I think that I think the reason being is that like the safety, the baseline safety stuff might come back and the probability of the answers. But for the same, I've, I've changed so much since <coughs> leaving that part of school that I probably would overthink the sports med ones and I would yeah. underthink <laughs> like the acute neuro ones and the acute spinal cord stuff because it's I know I, I think it's the biggest criticism of the boards is like they, they make you eligible to not kill somebody maybe in practice, but they still are not at all close to what we're doing now. And that's I mean it's hard for the test takers because they have to go through all the process of validating questions and the amount to two years of that process I understand but it's hard for us to talk to students about it because we're like I don't really remember a lot of right. that stuff. Dan? Uh, Sicard. <laughs> Sicard syndrome. <laughs> it's, a, it's a knife, right? knife and a quarter spinal cord track. Yeah. I got that. What do, you, what do you think Dan would you pass? I'd probably fail. Um, I don't know some of that stuff probably come back. I can't say that I reliably remember that stuff. I feel like the board is a lot of just memorization and Lab regurgitation. Value. And then when I came to clinic, it's really good to have all that knowledge, but a lot of it I haven't used. I, mean, I have a green filled filter in right now, because I have a DVT. 
I think that's something. What's your I, don't, I don't even know what you're saying. Unfortunately, if we <laughs> have a question, we can Google or PubMed, and everything is at our disposal, that's whatever a, we need. That's it. a terrible lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for another great episode. Awesome questions again. We love it. Go to uh, MikeReynolds.com. Click on that podcast link. There's a form to fill out to ask us some questions, and we're, we're loving them. We're getting a ton of questions every month. We love it. So keep sending us questions, and if you can, subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. That would help us uh, a bunch. So thanks so much. We'll see you guys on the next episode.